Hi, Peter here. Thank you for joining us for our fifth, I can't believe, our fifth virtual reading. We're happy that you're with us tonight and we know that you're going to be safe, sound, and taken care of. Good to see you and we look forward to seeing you in person. I'd like to thank, as always, my Murphy writing colleagues, Stephanie Cawley and Bella Coyle, who arranged this and our other activities. Without them, we would be dark, like most theaters. And tonight, we're happy to see and listen to Barbara Daniels, Andy Hockman, and Maribel Garcia. You can read their bios on the Murphy Writing website, so I'm not going to bore you and read them to you. You can do that yourselves. Uh, by the way, next week we will feature Lois Harrod, Mimi Schwartz, and Paul Victor Winters. And if you missed our previous readings, you can uh, experience them again on our YouTube channel. Go to Murphy Writing, no, go to YouTube and stick Murphy Writing in there, and uh, they'll pop up. Stephanie will also post it in the chat on the side there. Um, let's see, what else do you need to know? Uh, rather than have you scream and shout, you can do a virtual scream and shout. If you go to the bottom of your page, um, you can clap or you can um, put a thumbs up. Uh, if you uh, would like to do that after uh, you hear the poems and uh, hear the stories that our reader is going to read, or you can also just go virtual, real like that. All right, so that's what I um, want to tell you. And if you're not familiar with it already, each morning, Monday through Friday, we offer a write-in, a daily writing prompt and uh, feedback program on Canvas. Again, if you go to the Murphy Writing uh, website, you can sign in for that. It's a free program. And then three days a week, Monday at four, Wednesday at seven, and Friday at noon, uh, we have write-ins. We get together like this, and uh, we use one of the prompts, and we write together for an hour, and then share what we wrote. That's free, too, although it's not really free writing, but you're not paying for it, so I guess it is. And uh, we hope that you'll join us and invite your other friends who are also home and alone and like to write to do it. All right, so um, let me also suggest that uh, you keep your cameras on. So this way our readers can see your face and you uh, smile, etc. So right now, please welcome Barbara Daniels, Andy Hoffman, and Maribel Garcia. Oh, we're starting with Maribel, right? Okay, <laughs> um, so thank you for being here today, everyone. Um, I'm going to be sharing some slides to make it, I know that uh, th this whole online experience has been something new, so I thought maybe I'd show um, some visuals so people wouldn't be so bored to death with my, <laughs> but this is the cover of my book. My name is Maribel Garcia, and I wanted to share a little bit about my bio to give an idea of one of the, some of the themes that, that I write about. So let's see, in that, in that next slide we have, um, that's me in kindergarten, and I'm asking, what's your story? Next slide. I, at that age, I didn't think I had a story. As a, a child who came over to the US from Mexico in, in an immigrant community, in a, in a fairly impoverished one, I, I didn't, I didn't see myself in stories and I never would have thought myself as having a story. Next slide. And my point tonight is we all have a story to tell even when we think that we don't and our stories matter. Next. Um, so I was born in Miguel Alemán, Tamaulipas. On the left, this is, you know, like the, the bigger map of Mexico. In the middle is the, the city where I was born, but the little dusty town is this one like you know very much like the one on the right where you can't even really go to school so which is why a lot of Mexican immigrants like my parents had to leave the country next slide so in 1973 about at six months my mother and I joined my father um, and uh, you know officially and documented for a better life in the United States um, I did not see myself in the traditional immigrant narrative. You go to school and you find out about stories about Americans and, and the great melting pot, but you never see yourself there. We saw ourselves in, um, in this one and basically as illegal, undocumented people that, you know, we need, people need to be cautioned about. And that, so th that is to say that now that I'm, that I'm older and now that I'm writing is, and, and so much of my writing has to do with telling people, especially first generation um, immigrants, we all have stories to tell. 
even though we, you know, I think kids today, I'm older, I'm almost 50. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that a lot of our younger, a lot of the younger kids that I speak to grew up with more multicultural stories. I had Beverly clearly and I love her and thank her for it because she was working class out of, uh, um, in, in Seattle. And that, that helped a lot because that was the closest I could get to with, you know, Ramona. But so, and uh, so my book, talks a lot in, in, in the story that I'm telling, two Mexican-American sisters who are shaped by their race, class, and de gender, and sexuality navigate a very complex world where all of these things about them intersect with family relationships, with loss, forgiveness, and self-discovery. I want to start with, and I, I'd like to share some random excerpts from my novel that show how an author's cultural experience can help others better understand different worlds while also giving meaning to equally universal experiences. So in the next, um, we'll keep it on the next slide for a second. I'm, I'm talking about the, the two main characters, Isabel and Cristina, two sisters who in like, you know, and I think this happens in, my husband's white and I think that, you know, we talk about it, this happens in, in white families, black families, Latino families, you always have that blonde, blue eyed, you know, <laughs> my sister-in-law, for example, and my nieces who are just, very, very blonde, and the other kids may not be. And the same thing happens in Latino families and, and in Black families. So the first excerpt kind of talks about the, the two main characters and them dealing with this. In addition to being the dark-skinned sister, Isa had been the older sister with the non-existent social life because of her bookish ways and her inability to blend in with the crowd. Isa's younger sister was everything she wasn't a light-skinned, green-eyed beauty who took after their fair-skinned mother. Isa, on the other hand, was all Mateo. She was, like her father, a loner, but also what Mexicanas called Prieta, the dark one. You two look nothing alike. Hold on one second. Uh, family! <laughs> Sorry. You two look nothing alike. People's everyday comments were code, a polite way of calling attention to their differences. Isa could be standing right next to her sister and relatives would hone in on Cristina to compliment her green eyes or fair skin. This would happen all the time and people were so used to it that it never, they never noticed how blatantly bigoted they were being. Isa had never blamed Cristina or resented her. She couldn't. Cristina was one of the kindest people Isa knew, the only one who would notice her discomfort with these remarks and change the conversation. Growing up, it was clear that Cristina loved and respected her sister. When Isa's high school counselor tried to discourage her from applying to out-of-state colleges, even though she was at the top of her class, it was Cristina who pointed out how small-minded people in their town could be. In return, Isa had always been protective of her sister since her, their parents had never really learned English. It was Isa, one second, uh, Peter, can you guys please keep it down? I'm <laughs> sorry. In return, Isa had always been protective of her little sister since their parents had never really learned English. It was Isa who cut up cereal boxes and used the backs to make multiplication flashcards. When Cristina wasn't having any luck learning to read in first grade, it was Isa who had asked her first fourth grade teacher for help. Isa had been the one leading her mother through the maze of open houses and school conferences, acting as her younger sister's advocate and helping the whole family navigate a completely foreign educational system. Um, so the next slide, uh, I'm going to cut it a little bit there because I don't know how we're doing on time, but I wanted to go in. <laughs> and sorry about that. I mean, talk about... <laughs> So we're going to talk about um, kind of like where uh, sexuality figures in, into some of like conservative Latino cultures. Isa remembered almost everything about the day she became aware of who she really was. She was homesick with a cold and a temperature. It was late January and bitterly cold by South Texas standards. Her mother had plopped the family's old black and white portable television beside her bed. Cristina her little sister was upset about having to go to school when Isa was staying home. From the comforts of her grandmother's comfy wool colchas, Isa watched reruns of Good Times and the Jeffersons. In between napping and watching TV, she enjoyed her mother's delicious caldito de pollo and té de manzanilla. Maybe it was the cold medicine, but she was out and she didn't wake up until the next morning. She woke to the sound of noisy clanking and clattering in the kitchen. She figured her mom was knocking around pots and pans for what she thought was dinner. 
what turned out to be breakfast. She had slept all day and into the next. She had sat up and realized that her head no longer hurt when she moved. Then she remembered the dream. Everything had felt so good during it, but upon wakening, the weight of the dream's significance, what it said about her was crushing. A realization that made her almost sick in her own mouth. It was all wrong in its own right way. In the dream, Isa, short for Isabel, was at a birthday party at an unfamiliar house. She was kissing a girl with long brown hair, and the girl with the long brown hair was kissing her back. The feeling had been a good one. The sensation was intense and pleasurable, but it also had the unfortunate consequence of coloring both her mood and emotions, not just for days, but for the rest of her life. No one had to tell Isa that liking a girl was wrong. The message was everywhere. She hated feeling that there was something about her that made her bad, something that she had to keep secret. It wasn't something that she could run to tell her mom, like when a random man in the neighborhood asked her while grabbing his urine-stained crotch if she wanted to go back to his house and watch television with him. Her parents had been outraged. Her father, usually silent, started yelling obscenities and had gone out in the street to confront the pervert. And uh, this last, how are we doing on time, Stephanie? Can I do this? Oh, yeah. So this last one, I just wanted to show these slides. When we moved um, to, uh, from Mexico, my, my dad did a lot of um, construction work. And a lot of the skyscrapers you see in Houston, Chicago, Dallas, San Antonio, um, he, he was involved in a lot of that. But in the early 70s, these are, you know, the, the, the really bad neighborhoods is where we could afford to live. Our house looked like this when I lived in it, and then now it's uh, been gentrified. Then we moved up to the suburbs, which what to us was a trailer park. And when that became too dangerous, we moved to um, the US-Mexico border, which, which is where my novel takes place. And in this next slide, you show up, I, we show pictures of the col colonias, which is where I grew up at, towards the end. Um, and these are unincorporated settlements usually near the Mexican-American uh, border with, um, you know, not the best living conditions. So in my novel, uh, a lot of it takes place in these colonias. And this last excerpt talks about, you know, um, the, the, the young kids that I'm describing have left a nice uh, neighborhood to live with their grandparents who are growing up, you know, who are living here. After dinner that night, Beatriz and her two granddaughters walked into the darkness outside, guided by the flickering street lamps past the tiendita, and Calle Caballo. They came upon a large empty lot with a foundation and building materials all around it, and towards the back, a small Winnebago. And I happened to grow up in a small little Winnebago like that, so to me, it's, I romanticize them a lot. Like I still dream of like winning a million dollars and buying a trailer house. It wasn't exactly a mobile home, but a smaller affair, oh. one of those traveling trailers that had been converted into someone's home. Beatriz knocked on the door and Alicia answered, Pasen, pasen. Gracias, Alicia. Candy had been there before, so she scrambled up to the loft where two little girls closer to her age were watching The Lion King on a small DVD player. Alicia pointed to a small little table and continued talking to them while turning hot tortillas on the comal. This is your house, Beatriz. I'm so glad that we can help. Mia couldn't believe that a family of four could live in such tight quarters. And where did they even have space for a computer? Every square inch of the trailer was home to an object that normally would have been stashed in the closet. Clean laundry was neatly folded on top of the large crock pot in the corner. The ironing board had been folded and it was leaning against a battered blue suitcase that was bulging with books. It was obvious that the little loft was both bed and bedroom for the two little girls. And just when Mia was wondering where the parents slept, Alicia spoke as if reading her mind. It's a small space, isn't it? Come, follow me. I'll let you set up, she said as she gestured for Mia to follow her. It, it's not too small, lied Mia, embarrassed that she had probably been caught gawking. It, oh, this is just temporary. We're building our house, slowly but surely. Why pay apartment rent when we can live right here, right? Mia felt bad that Alicia, a grown woman, had felt that she had to explain herself. We don't have a printer or anything, but the internet is very reliable. Thank you. I went to college and dropped out. Now I'm back and taking classes online. Mia didn't know what an associate's was, but she was relieved when Alicia went back to the kitchen, only a foot away, and resumed her conversation with Abuela. The bedroom was very cozy. There was a real door that divided the bedroom from a tiny bathroom with a built-in shower stall. So that was just, you know, a little piece. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Barb Daniels, and I want you to know that my book is out, Talk to the Lioness, brand new book. Um, thanks to Kyle Laws and Casa de Cinco Hermanas Press for doing this. The name of it, um, Talk to the Lioness, comes from um, a poem called Circus Girl's Story. And I know a lot of times we think that people run away to join the circus, but this poem is about somebody who ran away from the circus. Circus Girl's Story. I ran away from the circus. I braved the flimsy basketwork swing and swaying wire. A clown taught me to put on flopping shoes, a bulbous nose. He showed me his winterberry mouth, his plum eyes, hoopers, jugglers. I was their changeling. I read to them, or pretended to, ran my hand down a page, but told my own story. Girl with the needle who comes while you sleep. Girl who turns herself into a mower, rolls forward, glistens, clacks her enemy under her turning sickle bar, and spits him out, minus an eyebrow or earlobe. I told death stories, a flaming stake, the vast iced north. An acrobat helped me walk on my hands. The trick rider grabbed me, stood me up on a bay horse's back and slapped its rump. When I fell, I was part of the act, the magnificent death drag. Did I kiss someone? Did he touch me? The top of the tent hid the trembling sky. I went to talk to the lioness. The calliope switched to a minor key. The lioness huffed and snuffled, her tongue a bold rubber muscle. She told me to run for it. I left my carbon fiber jumping stilts, spinning plates, shining knives, but I still breathe fire. I guess I need to warn you that there is a swear word in this next um, poem. So any very young people, just put your fingers in your ears for a second. Um, when my mother was dying, she was 99, so it was no surprise. She was in hospice, but she had asked not to have the regular medications that people get. So she was very aware of what was going on. And this is really a poem about her last words. Why am I blind? The last words of my friend's mother were, oh shit. My mother's were, you are forgiven. When Sandra bumped her, changing her depends, doing the ritual turning. Why am I blind? Mom had asked. Because you're dying. I'd said, your senses are failing, but I'm told you'll hear us till the end. How long will it take? You mean till you die? The doctors thought one more day. When I asked Sandra to sing for mom, it was amazing grace, a great rich river of sound as if we were standing in church. Mom slept then, or seemed to be sleeping. I touched her arm. Sandra left the room, sobbing. Um, we look a lot of different places for comfort. And in my next poem, I'm asking a tea set to comfort me. I move dishes around the kitchen, soiled, clean. This is grief. Fill a shelf with shining glassware, pour out curdled milk. Playing house required small dishes, sticks to stir mud cakes, mom's hats and soft shawl for dress up. Real house proved to be similar. Plates and bowls, rickety chairs, canned peas, pale toast, 
the glass of gin too small and weak to hearten me. The furnace broke, cold seeps in. Would the dead sneer if they knew I still have my little tin tea set? A needle rides an old record. A dead woman sings Strauss's last songs. I've played out the rope of me, hand over hand. My life is a frozen fish stick, a chicken nugget fuzzed with ice. There's a mirror in the freezer. I look in to see what's inside me. Red throat, iced up heart. My ancestors lived through the plague. Farm women wearing velvet gowns, stripped from corpses. I fear the plague and I dress for it. This blue velvet, this silver chain. Um, my strategy in my next poem is basically to betray people I love. So I'm telling secrets about my parents' sex life. So you know how, um, what a betrayal that is. It's also a betrayal of my uh, friend Brian McWilliams. And Brian has a poem that is a, a rebuttal to this, but uh, perhaps it's unfair if he's not here to give his side of it. But I definitely am betraying secrets about him. He's done a lot of, um, I guess what you could call house sitting for us, looking after the house. And he, so he knows a lot about us, but we know some things about him too. Dancing in the kitchen. Another woman slept here. Lovely, our friend says, though he won't say her name. Perhaps she cooked, perhaps they drank and danced. I found the radio set to a Russian station. When my father was forgetting everything, he wanted sex every day. He forgot the day before and the day before that. Dr. Cohen told mom he'd heard this from younger couples. Dad was 84. The doctor said mom could say no. Maybe she did. I have a husband who loves me. That helps me bless what love there is, what desiring. Hot oil in a pan, fragrance of garlic filling the kitchen, pork that spatters and burns my fingers. Our friend watched the house while my husband and I drove toward turning leaves and surf bursting on stones. It's as if the house is a secret snow leopard that only gets wilder if no one is watching. They're all dead now. My mother, her 10 brothers and sisters, my father, his brother, that brother's wife. Yet there is still desiring dance music, pork with fig sauce, and a strange toothbrush, a woman left by the sink. And um, my last poem is for my husband, David, and the name of it is Raffish. And the poem explores the question, what does that mean if somebody is raffish? And the poem concludes that it means disreputable, but attractive. Raffish. In the last hushed hour before waking, Silk garments slip from my body, lavender, green, teal, black, plum, until I am no one, perfectly indolent. Let's stick with the sacred acts. First kiss at daybreak, the newspaper, coffee. I worked out what raffish means, dirty dish, your unshaven, almost piratical face. In the bedroom under the eaves, crumpled paper, socks, lint, books, disreputable, but attractive. <laughs> Today has the ease of summer, casting off clothes, bare legs and arms, our crooked feet. One leaf on the ivy curls upward, 
waiting to open. Let's agree to agree. August is for this, placating the body, letting the hours slow and subside. Tell me what you always tell me, those endearments, the blue walls shadowed to gray, the yellow ones struck by light. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I want to give a deep bow of gratitude to Peter, Stephanie, and Taylor at Murphy Writing for pulling the ropes and um, making this opportunity for all of us to come together through words. Um, thank you also to Barbara and Mary Bell, my sister readers tonight, and uh, thank you to all of you out there listening, wherever you are. I want to start with words from another writer because we all are standing on someone else's shoulders. Uh, this is a poem by the late, great Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here, on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. I've been thinking a lot in these past six weeks of uh, sheltering in place about connection and uh, what it is that connects us even when we can't be in the same place physically. This essay is called Long Distance Call. My cell phone doesn't ring that often, especially not at 7.40 a.m. So when the phone began to buzz early one morning, I had to look. The caller ID said, Dad. That would have been odd under any circumstance. My father owned a cell phone, only at my mother's insistence. He never charged the device and rarely carried it. I doubt he even knew the number. But as of that winter morning, he had been dead for 20 months. I watched as the phone pulsed, Dad. Dad, Dad, I do believe people occasionally send messages from beyond that unmapped field. How else to explain why my friend Claudia's watch stopped at the exact moment her mother died? Even though Claudia was on a cruise, her watch locked in the ship's safe deposit box while her mother took her last breath in a hospital outside Philadelphia. How to account for the smoke that spiraled from a wastebasket after Sarah begged for a sign from her friend who died of AIDS, or the see-through sprite, the figure of a young boy who clambered up a dresser and vanished before my partner's astonished eyes. But I don't believe the dead dialed direct. And anyway, while we buried my father with a miscellany of keepsakes, family photographs, a Miracle League baseball cap, a pocket full of ceramic hearts on which we'd written messages in Sharpie, we did not tuck the Samsung Galaxy into his casket. The phone continued purring. Slide to answer, instructed the bubble. For one hot, spooked second, I imagined pressing my thumb to the screen and hearing my father's pebbly Brooklyn twang, the voice that always answered the phone, yellow, the voice that told me between gasps just before doctors inserted the ventilator tube, I love you so much and I'm so proud of you. Once I mailed a postcard to my parents from Zihuatanejo, Mexico, it took 13 months to arrive. Could this be similar? An old phone message initiated more than a year ago and archived in that amorphous cloud, only now worming its way to the light? A ghost pocket call triggered by an atmospheric blip? Or perhaps a cruel hoax perpetrated by some basement-dwelling telecommunications troll? 
my sense of reason had pretty much dissolved. Still, I thought if the source were a mean-minded stranger, wouldn't my caller ID signal unknown? Some imposter could pose as my father, but only one contact in my cell phone's queue said, Dad. In an episode of Black Mirror, a speculative British TV anthology, a woman whose fiancé dies in an accident learns of a website through which she can contact her sweetheart. The site mines every bit of the dead person's digital data, every email, text, and social media post, then uses that trove to generate characteristic responses. At first, the grieving woman finds the idea bizarre. But once she realizes that she's pregnant, she's desperate to share that news with her beloved. She clicks on the link. She emails a tentative hello. And her lover emails back. With all his familiar wry humor and idiosyncratic turns of phrase, the messages sound so like him that she takes the next step and orders an avatar, again extrapolated from her sweetheart's digital footprint. It comes in a large cardboard box, a scrum of pale, stiff limbs that need to be reconstituted like sea monkeys in a warm tub. After a finger-biting 20 minutes, a man emerges from the bathroom, a little wan, a little shy, but looking and talking and acting just like the dead fiancé. The woman realizes she's treading on perilous turf. She can't help herself. It's not so much denial, she was at the burial, she wore the black dress, as desire, a ferocious, beyond all sanity yearning to see that person again. I get it. What wouldn't I trade for one more moment cocooned in my father's arms? One more foxtrot at a family bar mitzvah with him counting softly in my ear? One more email tapped out in his signature rat-a-tat rhythm. You can guess what happens in the TV show. Gradually, the woman realizes that this walking, talking replica of her beloved isn't really him. There's verisimilitude down to the v-neck sweaters and the inside jokes, but something's missing. He can only say what he's said before, only do what he's already done. She'll change. He's stuck. The dead stay dead. That's the awful, incontrovertible grief of it. They do not show up at your door with a pint of blueberries that just happened to be on sale at Wegmans. They never meet you for coffee at the farmer's market on a Friday morning and insist on paying even though you are 53 years old. They never write a card that ends, I love you to the stars and back. They do not call. I answered the phone, and the voice I heard after my shaky hello was treble, not gravel. I remembered. After months of avoiding any of my dad's possessions, my mother had finally given the cell phone to my 10-year-old cousin, Dylan, so she wouldn't be incommunicado during her 45-minute ride to school. I could hear the clamor of kid voices, the grind of a bus. Oh, hi. I meant to call my friend, she said. I'm sorry. I didn't tell Dylan about my weirded out tumble of thought after the phone rang. I didn't tell her how my hand quavered as I picked it up. I said the ordinary thing, the thing we get to say to the ones who are still here. That's okay, sweetie. It's good to hear your voice. For, uh, for many of us, um, and definitely for me, the week of March 9th was when the pandemic came close to home. This essay is one chronicle of that week. It's called Poetry in the Time of Coronavirus. On Monday, two days before the World Health Organization declares COVID-19 a pandemic, the principal waits outside her public elementary school, greeting students with hugs. I get one too. I've known her for almost two decades, ever since I started visiting each spring as a writer in residence. When I ask about coronavirus, she's insouciant. We're not closing. There are no cases in the county. The kids need to be here. And here they are. Three classes of squarely second graders standing in lopsided circles. For the next five days, I tell them, you're going to look at the world through your poet's eye. We try it. 
Rain is not rain, one writes. It is a bear banging on the window. The sun is a copper penny, a soccer ball rolling onto the moon, a bowl of chips. I walk around, peeking over shoulders, keeping my distance from the sneezing girl in the flower sprig jumpsuit, willing myself not to touch my face. And then I stop, because someone has written, the stars are not stars. They are the dogs of dawn getting led to the good parts of your heart. How long can a virus live on a piece of paper? I ask permission from the writer, a shy brown haired boy. Then I lift the sheet from his desk and read that line to the entire class. By Wednesday, the principal has stopped hugging. She starts each morning with a mindful moment on the public address system, urging everyone to settle your body and close your eyes. I dash to the bathroom during the Pledge of Allegiance, but I pause for real during the mindful moment. I feel my heart rate slow from its top of the news hour canter. I stand in the conference room, eyes closed. I wait for the chime. Back in the classroom, the kids add line breaks, goof with metaphors, and go shopping on Alliteration Avenue, where you can buy slithery snakes and cold cucumbers, but never pinto beans. What is the taste of yellow? What is the feeling of green? What sounds live inside you? What's going on with the girl who eats her school-provided French toast nuggets in the classroom, then sinks her head onto her folded arms? On Tuesday, the teacher gestures for me to leave the child alone. But the next day, after breakfast and a brisk antiseptic swabbing of her desk, she writes, inside me is my grandma humming her favorite song. While driving to school, I listen obsessively to public radio, the new vocabulary of disease, aerosolized transmission, abundance of caution, social distancing, high touch. Even the generic name for COVID-19, novel coronavirus, has a lyrical ring, a bug with kingly aspirations, little germ with an outsized ego. Each morning brings a new restriction. The barista at Starbucks can no longer touch my personal mug. Theaters and museums close. My 19-year-old daughter will finish her first year of college from the couch. What will these next months look like? How will we stay connected? My partner shows me a video from Italy, an entire country on quarantine, a narrow, crooked street, people singing out their windows. The second graders tug me back to this moment, this place. There is a girl whose every poem includes the words, oof, oof, oof. Another who writes, blue is the sound of hand sanitizer. They follow me around the room, holding their writing out like alms. On day three, I lose 10 minutes of teaching time while the kids wash hands before lunch. They lather up at the single classroom sink, then form a new line to rinse and dry. Some mold the antibacterial foam into cotton candy peaks. On day four, they write about what scares them. 20 students and not a whisper about coronavirus. They're frightened of one-eyed monsters and Voldemort, of trees and porcupines, of going into the ocean. Four say they are scared of the dark. One writes, I'm afraid of losing my friends, family, and teachers. Maybe that is about coronavirus after all. I learned there will be no day five. The district calls an emergency in-service session so teachers can prepare for online learning. How will that work, I wonder, in a place where, for some, no school means no breakfast, no lunch, no access to the nurse? What about the kids whose homes lack Wi-Fi or laptops or adults who can afford to stay away from work? Will there still be mindful moments? How will they learn so far apart? These kids whose ahas come at close range, me kneeling by a desk, questioning and coaxing, our faces bent over a penciled sheet of paper. We have 10 more minutes. I gather them into a circle and recite a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye that ends, there is a place to stand where you can see so many lights you forget you are one of them. What I hope, I tell the kids, is that you won't forget, that you will stay awake in the world, notice everything, then write it down. Words are not a cure for coronavirus or for anything else, but they can be a balm. They are connective tissue, especially at a time when we can't touch. 
The kids wiggle, they poke each other, and the girl in the jumpsuit sneezes, forgetting once again to use her sleeve. What will they remember from this week? What will I never forget? The dogs of dawn, the child whose grandmother hums inside her, the one who wrote, I remember when it was summer for the first time for me. As I leave the room, I pump out a glug of hand sanitizer. It sounds blue. Thank you. Thank you all for listening and thank you especially Barb, Andy and Maribel, that was really terrific. Um, stay safe, we hope to see you again next week for our Friday night when we have our readers. Um, I lost my place here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> next week when we have uh, Lois Harrod, Mimi Schwartz and Paul Victor Winters. Stay safe, keep writing and if you wanna join us in our writings during the week, we welcome you as well. Thank you again. Thank you.